The story begins with Ashley, or better known as Lele, asking her brother Andrew, aka Andy, to help her with a mysterious task which he is clearly reluctant of. Despite his reluctance, Ashley pushes him to help her, with Andrew protesting that this task involves Ashley's friend, implying she will be placed in harm's way. Either way, Ashley is very persistent, which seemingly leads to Andy complying with her. This little mysterious preface with the nature of the task being veiled seems to have happened when Ashley and Andrew were kids, being accordingly called Lele and Andy as kids, which leads to the current time with Ashley exploring the house trying to search for some food. It appears they are locked in as she mentions the doors have been locked for months when Ashley finally finds a can of tomatoes and subsequently takes it to Andy's room to share it. Andy shows no enthusiasm eating the tomato saying he had it on purpose as it's the last thing they have left. Regardless, he gives in to Ashley's temptations and gives her the green light to cook them. As Ashley goes to cook them, she hears loud bangs and knocks with a person shouting on the other side of the door simply known as the warden. Checking on Ashley and Andrew if they're still alive, clearly aware of them being trapped there with barely any food yet not willing to help them. The warden despite asking if they're still alive doesn't seem interested whether they would be dead or not, just saying he doesn't bring food to dead people, with the last food delivery seemingly not being delivered due to a mix-up. The situation seems dire and Ashley and Andrew constantly talk about dying, uncertain if they would actually survive with the dilemma that they're in, seeming as if they are kidnapped and locked in an unkempt place under mysterious reasons. The warden quickly leaves with Ashley having no other choice but to cook the can of tomatoes. Ashley explains how they are barely surviving to the point of starvation as she overdrinks to satiate her hunger. Just as they viciously attack their plates of tomatoes, loud ominous music plays coming from the next door neighbor. The duo take the balcony key and go to their balcony which reveals that they are in a block of apartments. Setting a wood plank to cross over to their neighbor's balcony, they peek through the window to see their neighbor rocking a black robe and performing cultist rituals, hence explaining the ominous nature of the music. The neighbor seems to be calling to demons for some advice which makes Ashley and Andrew feel uneasy, going back to their apartment, dismissing it as the neighbor's hubby. They decide to watch TV as it's the schedule for the TV access, having signals only at certain times, when an announcement reports on the tainted water which has led to more than 53 deaths. It's soon revealed that the people have been kept in their apartment for quarantine as they have been exposed to this water. The quarantine reveals to be for another two weeks until the authority ensures the disease is fully contained and controlled. This explains why Ashley and Andrew have been stuck in their apartment, but it doesn't explain why the warden didn't care much about them, and he even treated their well-being very lightly. The scene suddenly changes to a flashback where their mother leaves Andrew and Ashley in the same apartment, which is in a much better condition, in order to go to a hotel with their father, mentioning that they will be reunited very soon, joining them until after something is done. Soon it's shown that a nurse visited their house, taking their blood sample for testing if they are contaminated by the water, explaining if their blood test comes back clean, they would be free to go and come as they wish, but if not, they will be trapped in the apartment. It's clear what happens next, with the blood test being implied to have shown contamination. Being young and not familiar how to manage, Ashley constantly calls her mother, who with no explanation left them to go to a hotel, who shows reluctance to communicate with Ashley any longer, denying Ashley's claims that they are being treated badly and that they are underfed to the point of starvation. It seems as if the mother wants nothing to do with them anymore. In the middle of the night, Ashley decides to clean, not letting the intrusive thoughts get the better of her. As she starts cleaning, she faints due to extreme hunger, reawakening shortly after with Andrew taking care of her, making her lie down next to him on the couch watching some more TV announcements. The announcement confirms that there has been supply shortage, but as of recently, they have solved that problem, so they should have supply sometime soon. The announcement in a passive-aggressive tone explains that any contact with family or friends in the quarantine departments are highly prohibited, punishable by death, which could explain why the mother refused to talk with Ashley any longer.
After some time, the phone starts ringing with Ashley not having the energy to stand up to get it. Instead, Andrew gets to the phone with Ashley barely understanding what's happening, just noticing whoever is on the other side of the line as irritated and loud, which makes Andrew very uncomfortable and defeated, with the line suddenly dropping. It turns out it was Andrew's girlfriend who broke up with him, seemingly because of the uncertainty of what will happen to the parasite-infected quarantined individuals, and how badly they are treated by the authorities and how serious they are about the infection. As they sleep the night away, awakening the next day, they notice a lady from their building being taken into an ambulance who doesn't seem to be moving. Knowing the authorities don't care about them as they refuse to bring them food and refuse to even help Ashley when she passed out with Andrew calling, they ponder if she had died due to hunger, especially as so many people on their balconies shout for help and some food being treated similarly to Ashley and Andrew. As days pass with Ashley phasing in and out, sleeping the days or fainting. She awakens one day to the loud bangs of Andy hitting the door, trying to knock the door down, even though it seems it has been barred and reinforced from the outside. That's when the voice of the warden can be heard, threatening them that they won't get any food tonight if they continue banging, as if they ever get food, with it almost being weeks going without food. Andrew, not wanting to risk the chance, stops banging in hopes of the delivery taking place today. As they wait, being hopeful, of course, nothing gets delivered, with the warden manipulating them and keeping them by the threat of not getting food and the reward of getting some, completely dismissing basic human rights, threatening the infected people like rabid rodents. It's clear there's more to the story than shows, as they would show symptoms already with healthcare professionals visiting them to monitor them, but they don't have enough energy to think anymore with the loud music being even more unbearable. That's when they hear a loud roar which makes their curiosity get the better of them going to the neighbor's balcony to check on what's going on. As they peek, they see a demonic entity actually summoned which the neighbor regards to as his lord. It becomes clear that the neighbor relied on demonic rituals to save himself from starvation and being trapped as he asks the demon to be let out. As he has nothing to offer, the demon accepts his request but in return takes his life, which momentarily clouds Ashley and Andrew vision with only the lifeless body of their neighbor staying behind. Shocked and horrified, Ashley and Andrew in fear and panic double check to see if what they saw was real, not being delirious due to the extreme hunger. But soon, this concern transforms into curiosity and hopes as they start thinking as the neighbor is dead now, they can loot his apartment for resources and food. As they rummage through the place, they find nothing edible when they stare at the corpse mesmerized as if being on there, especially their thoughts speak loudly when they plan on eating the corpse, with it seeming very appetizing at this point of starvation, with only concern they have being cut with no one believing them a demonic entity killed the neighbor and not them. They use a cleaver knife and get to business, letting their primal instincts for survival take over. As Ashley takes care of the arms, she gets to find some plastic bags to cover up what they're doing as they would be exposed going through the balcony. Ashley comes across a book titled Demon Summoning for Dummies, which reveals the neighbor was not in fact a cultist, but an ordinary individual who turned to seek help from demonic entities and desperation. Andrew and Ashley place the severed body parts in the plastic bags which barely contain them, taking them back to their apartment to finally eat and survive at least for several more days. Being shockingly unfazed about what they did, Ashley cooks gleefully as if it is completely normal. On the other hand, Andrew looks clearly uncomfortable, retching while eating, which strangely offends Ashley who pressures him to eat. Fully content, Ashley goes to sleep, not seeming affected by what they just did at all, as a matter of fact looking like she's never been better before. That's when she has flashbacks of her childhood and Andrews talking about a friend of hers who said to her that she had a crush on Andrew. In a weird and uncomfortable manner which might appear as childish talk, Ashley mentions how no one can steal her brother from her, being jealous saying how she will accordingly punish the supposed friend. It's soon revealed to be the same flashback flashback that was shown in the beginning of the game, with Ashley talking Andrew into luring his friend into an abandoned warehouse and locking her in for the night, all because she had a crush on Andrew. Andrew appearing as he didn't have the mind of his own, easily manipulated by Ashley, shows reluctance but eventually agrees to this cruel plan. 
As they fool the friend to play hide and seek with them, Ashley tricks the friend into going inside a rusty box which she sets on, rushing Andrew to bar the opening so she won't be able to get out. As the friend learns about their cruel plan, she starts coughing vigorously, saying how the dust is affecting her asthma, making her struggle to breathe. Andrew refuses to lock the box, demanding Ashley to get off to let the friend out, but instead she manipulates Andy by playing the victim card, saying how the friend is popular and well loved liked compared to her, starting to cry and making Andrew decide between her and the friend, saying that she prefers the friend. This makes a young and stupid Andrew take the sister's side and bend to her demands, locking the poor friend in, whom Ashley is severely jealous of. They leave the friend locked in the box, saying that they will come back for her the next day. The flashback comes to an end with Ashley and Andrew back to their current conundrum. Andrew is seen struggling to sleep due to the immense guilt he feels for eating the flesh of a human being while Ashley is completely unaffected. Rationalizing with Andrew why they shouldn't feel guilty as they didn't kill the guy, fully unapologetic as if what they did doesn't bear any ethical weight. Trying to reason with Andrew, Ashley breaks down how they are being treated like the worst criminals even though they are the victims here. The shady water company neglects the filtering process, supplying unaware residents with parasite-infested water. Then they lock them in for months, starving them and not tending to their needs. That's when Andrew breaks down, explaining the grisly details of how he had to fit the remainder of the corpse in the freezer, displaying how traumatizing it truly was. That's when Ashley tries to calm Andrew and keeps calling him Andy, a name he was called when he was a kid, which he doesn't like. Ashley acts very inappropriately with Andrew here, making weird insinuations and jokes of how romantic it is that they are together in this coffin of a house and will probably be together when they die, which Andrew clearly doesn't like and feel comfortable about. The next day, Andrew and Ashley go to their deceased neighbor's apartment to find a way out. They consider summoning the demon to ask it a favor to let them out. That's when the warden knocks on the door, being suspicious that the neighbor has died, audibly being annoyed that he has to report this. He mentions on his walkie-talkie that he was type B anyway, as if this entire quarantine is a hoax, with the authorities performing some sort of a cruel experiment on the unaware individuals. They hear the warden moan about having to check on the neighbor, but he explains he would do his round beforehand. That gives Ashley and Andrew some time to mop the floor of any blood and get rid of any evidence before the warden enters. As Ashley barely manages to clean the blood, she hides in the closet, but the warden quickly finds her. Just as he's about to question Ashley, she feels blood spattering all over her when the warden's body drops to the floor with Andrew standing behind him with a bloodied cleaver knife, extending his hand to Ashley, referring to her as Lele, her childhood name. Knowing that they are in big trouble now, with no excuse saving them from persecution, they intend to go on the run, never to contact any family or friends, as none helped them when they were stuck. They take the warden's key and open the door, noticing how all the doors are in fact barricaded from the outside. They soon notice a piece of note attached to each door, with their door having a mark of two type ABs. The other doors have type O and type A and B. This clearly shows when the warden talked about the neighbor just being type B, he referred to the importance of each individual, with the notes being blood types. Of course, blood type O- is the most beneficial, as they can donate to each blood type, while AB can only donate to AB being known as the universal recipient. Therefore, the warden didn't care much for the siblings as their blood wasn't that beneficial. This was also true for the neighbor, who was just blood type B. So it seems whoever had blood type O received the most care as they could extract their blood, meaning this entire quarantine was a hoax to use people against their will. A note on the fridge of the warden's office confirms this as it reads from a specific time onwards, type ABs won't be offered any more supplies, explaining how the resident's blood and organs are being extracted, with AB being the least compatible with donation, therefore the least cared for. The notes also at times have a cross over them, which might be an indication of the persons being dead inside. The siblings acquire a key to room 302, which is the only open and unbarricaded door. They go in to be only surprised by the resident wanting to stay in when they offer her a way out. 
She explains that she's being well fed here, having variety of foods, while she can play all that she wants. The siblings, surprised and confused, leave the lady contemplating on why she gets a different treatment. The siblings decide to go back to the fourth floor and perform the ritual, offering the soul of the other warden in the building in return of asking the demon to free them. They threaten the lady from room 302 with the cleaver knife to lure the other warden to room 405, where the ritualistic circle is drawn so they can perform the ritual. Andrew stays behind keeping the lady hostage while Ashley goes up to finish what they planned. As the demon is summoned, Ashley offers the soul of the warden, which in return, the demon provides her with an item which gives her the ability of seeing future in occasional dreams. The demon also makes a noteworthy remark that Ashley's soul is dark as tar, something that we are already fully aware of based on her previous actions, manipulative tendencies, disregard to innocent lives, and narcissistic behaviors. As Ashley goes down planning to kill the hostage lady for no reason, she comes to the scene of the lady being killed by Andrew. Andrew explains he let go of her as he thought she wouldn't be any longer a threat, but she tried to use a nail gun on him which he was quicker, killing her before getting shot. Ashley being her manipulative and disgustingly jealous self makes remarks that Andy thought that she was pretty and wanted to have his way with her, that's why he just let her go, which of course gets under the skin of and easy to gaslight Andrew. Ashley being her usual narcissistic, overly and weirdly jealous self that Andrew could potentially be attracted to girls. She loses it and makes it weird about herself that his priorities should be about her being very weird indeed and possessive. Andrew having enough of how weird and intrusive Ashley is of his love life explains that he knows that she harassed his ex-girlfriend and that's why she broke up with him. This revelation doesn't face Ashley at all who seems to be even proud about what she did. Andrew, clearly uncomfortable of how intrusive Ashley is, complains about it when she brings up the worst case scenario that he wouldn't care if she died, just to make it all about herself and wanting all the attention to herself, not letting Andrew have a normal, healthy life. That's when Ashley starts to blame everything that happened on Andrew, killing the lady, the warden, and desecrating the corpse of their neighbor, even though the mastermind was always herself. She even goes so far as to blame the death of their childhood friend on Andrew on how she suffocated on the box, which Ashley wanted her to be in, manipulating a stupid Andrew to be an accomplice. This reveals Ashley's twisted and sick mind on how narcissistic she truly is, only caring about herself and twisting reality and facts to manipulate people. It was never about her loving Andrew, she had a sick and twisted obsession to be his number one, to be the center of attention, even if that meant that she would take the place of Andrew's intimate partners. She goes on how Andrew is a failure and a mess, having no one but her to listen to and talk to, having Andrew at her fingertips to play with as she pleases. The siblings have an intense argument with Ashley being threatening, which ends with Andrew wrapping his hands around her neck, choking her, but soon he lets go, saying she wants to leave this place with him. She then mentions how she lacks any compassion or remorse for the passing of the innocent girl in their childhood even till now, as no one ever found out it was them. Ashley being obsessive and controlling is still in her dreams of being adventurous like they used to be as children, being completely insufferable. They then go to the second floor where they use a carpet to climb down the window to the street. The siblings contemplate about their future and how they could live, thinking of changing place to place, living an isolated life or something else. When Ashley tells Andrew about the item that she got from the demon that would give her visions of the future. The siblings then get on a bus and leave the place for good, leaving everything behind, with the sister being her usual toxic possessive self, not wanting Andrew to find any partner and only being with her, with the stupid Andrew conforming to her ridiculous and manipulative demands. Now, a few major aspects of the story are left unexplained. To start with, the relationship between Andrew and Ashley was pretty weird. It's safe to say Ashley acted very strangely, getting extremely jealous every time Andrew had a girlfriend. She was so possessive and toxic to the point of wanting to kill any girl, even having a crush on him. But Andrew is not all innocent here despite what it might appear, in fact, he was an enabler. Letting Ashley continue on her parade of toxicity, maybe even deep down, Andrew liked it how jealous and possessive Ashley was about him. 
And of course, he acted as her muscle doing what she demanded from him. That includes killing an innocent young child whose only sin and crime was liking a sick and twisted Andrew. The relationship gets even weirder when Ashley makes very inappropriate remarks, which I won't show, not for YouTube to take the video down, of course. I couldn't help but feel there's more to the story of their relationship than just typical siblings. The way Ashley acted, she seemed like she didn't love Andrew, she seemed to be obsessively in love with him. It also didn't help that they didn't have a strong support from their parents who abandoned them to rot in the quarantined apartment block. Even though authorities suggested any outside interference would be faced with lethal punishment, parents' love would overcome any fear of death or persecution. Either way, the siblings Sibling's love for each other, despite how toxic and inappropriate, was seemingly stemmed from the lack of love they received from the parents, thinking they are the only ones that they could rely on. Now, something that was quite ambiguous was the apartment building and the entire parasite infested water story, which didn't make much sense. Even the siblings started to question the legitimacy of the story. First off, after being trapped in their apartment for over three months, they didn't experience any symptoms of the disease, which indicated they didn't really have any infection. Secondly, they were completely cut off from making any contact with any friends or family or the outside world. Regardless to how contagious a disease could be, it would never jump from one person to another from a simple phone call, something the siblings didn't have the privilege of. The TV announcement also were clearly pre-recorded and broadcasted at specific times for the prisoners to further spread the propaganda. We then learn each apartment door as labeled with the resident's blood type, with the universal donor blood type O having a lot of privilege getting unlimited supplies while other blood types being left to die, such as AB which are universal recipients meaning they can't donate to majority of people. So the lady from room 302 who was spoiled, overfed and let to do anything she wanted could possibly be a universal donor with blood type O. Therefore by the looks of it, it seems the authorities were running some sort of cruel experiment on these people people lying to them that they are being quarantined due to being infected. They were treated differently based on how easily they could donate their blood, or even more twistedly, their internal organs. So maybe these individuals were selected to supply elite members of society with spare blood and organs in case that they needed them. As typos could donate to a large number of people, they were well taken care of, while ABs who couldn't donate to majority of people were left to their own device to whether survive or die. But most importantly, not to waste supplies on them with both siblings being AB, hence why they were left to starve. It's a possibility that the parents were even on it, hence why they didn't want anything to do with the siblings anymore. There are more things happening in the story as well, such as summoning a demon and cannibalism, which makes the universe of the game that much more complex. A universe where demons are real and can be summoned using a simple instruction for dummies book, which leads to Ashley getting a supernatural ability of having visions about the future, which we didn't see how it would work in this game. She even gets told by the demon how dark her soul is, something that she is clearly aware of but doesn't have any remorse about. There might be a sequel to the story as it felt that this was a build up to the main story, with this game acting as an introduction to a more complex and large universe. There's also a lot of foreshadowing in the game that Ashley would surely get what she deserves after locking their friend in a box which led to her death. In a twisted turn of events, Fate played a fair game of locking both Andrew and Ashley in a bigger box, waiting for their own death, but interestingly, they managed to escape and change their own doomed fate. Alright folks, that's about it for this video. What are your thoughts and opinions about the game and especially its ending, because it was quite convoluted in my opinion? Let me know in the comment section down below. As always, it's been your host Star, thank you for being here, and I... We'll see you on the next video. Have a fantastic day.